Day three. Okay, we've already talked about what drone video can do to promote your work or your business, whether that is promoting something unrelated or getting eyes on your work in general. We've also talked about fears that we hear holding our students back and why it's pretty silly to let them stop you from pursuing this aggressively. So I think I've made it pretty clear that no matter what you wanna do, whether you think I'm full of it or you wanna do every single thing I've listed, no matter what, before you promote yourself, you have to make sure you have good stuff to share with to begin. That is what's gonna get people to click like or click buy or share whatever, you have to post good content. So here are the things that I look for when I'm hiring a drone for a job or for video, and this is like most other camera operators or directors. The number one for me is camera movement. It can't be sitting still and it can't be turning awkwardly in a circle in one spot turning left and right. Starting and stopping mid shot and showing yourself adjusting in your reel are obvious mistakes, but to appear good, you need to have movement, but do it smoothly and consistently the entire time and that's the only part you show. This means consistent clean pans, slow tilting and steady flight, unlike the jerky harsh defaults that come with DJI drones for some reason and I still don't know why they do this, but it drives me nuts. You can change the gimbal settings and the drone settings so it doesn't stop harsh. It kind of glides to a finish and the camera kind of smoothly comes to an end. So that's how you get really good stuff, but at the very least, just make sure you don't show human error in your reel. And that means you're flying after something and you stop and you adjust and then you decide oh my god no i want to go forward no up and you see yourself moving around in zigzags it just feels like <laughs> there's a guy who can't see the screen very well trying to figure out what's going on i don't want to imagine somebody behind the camera it should be like this floating invisible omniscient you know like in a movie you don't feel the camera guy there you just see what's happening i have chapters about this in the course and it would take way too long to just go into this completely in detail but if you have shaky footage and you don't know what to do with it i use adobe premiere pro as an editor and in this software you have something called warp stabilizer it's literally a drag and drop effect it'll analyze the frames look for the shaky parts it'll crop them out and only keep the parts of the image that are still it'll match them all up and then seconds later you have way way more stable footage the next thing I'm looking for is the coloring. More specifically, it's the picture setup, the contrast. If I see contrast so deep that it's total black in the middle of broad day, that's a deal breaker for me. If you turn down the default contrast in these drones, which again, for some reason are all set to the most amateur settings, you get way richer details in the shadows. But the actual professional method is to shoot everything with a really flat, colorless, not contrasty, not saturated picture because everything will remain visible to the drone. The clouds won't be too bright, the shadows won't be too dark. Then in the editor, which is on your computer and that has a way more powerful processor and can, and can calculate color way better, you can add the contrast later and add the color and this is how you get really good, really accurate, great looking stuff. Especially with a drone like a Mavic Pro, the first one, or the Phantom 3s, you are really trying to milk every bit of that data. You need every edge you can give yourself with footage that isn't super rich. And just look at how rich the difference is between shot one, which is the default setting, and shot two, which is contrast and saturation at negative two in the Phantom's picture profile settings. Plus a little coloring with Adobe Premiere Pro, the difference is seriously night and day and it's so easy to do. And number three is knowing how to get a true cinematic picture in whatever environment you're in, sunset, midday, whatever. Now this is just icing on the cake, but it's something I notice because I have to edit footage all day long. If footage is shot with a really high shutter speed, anything moving in the shot will look really choppy. That's because there's a ton of light and you only have to expose each individual frame for like one twelve hundredth of a second to get a well lit frame of video. Then it does it 24 times in a second and you have a moving picture with lots of choppy, chunky looking footage. Cinematic footage is usually double the shutter speed of whatever you're filming at. So 24 frames per second, it'll be like 1 50th shutter. 60 frames per second would be 1 120th. Point is it's double the frame rate. This gives you a very soft, gentle blur on everything that is much more pleasing to the eye. Knowing when to lower the aperture or put on an ND filter, which are like sunglasses for your camera, to darken the image a little bit, really will put you miles ahead and give you a buttery smooth cinematic image like you see on TV or in movies that's soft to look at and not harsh and way too sharp. This isn't even the end of the world because it doesn't mean what you're filming isn't cool to look at anymore. It just means you're demonstrating you understand the application of these things and why they're important. So you're not just some dude with a drone. However, you do have to practice with each drone and figure out what your specific drone settings are because they're all a little different. And I don't mean different manufacturers, I mean every drone. Like how the Mavic Pro and the Phantom 3 Advance have the same sensor in them, but for some reason, the color is handled way different. 
For example, the Mavic Pro 1 has an artificial blurring that is supposed to give it a softer look and it actually just creates issues. This is something DJI decided to go with. I don't know why, but I always adjust the sharpness to plus one. Not because adding sharpness helps so much, but I've noticed in side-by-sides that it just negates the artificial blur. Another example is that the Phantom 3 and 4s all have the opposite issue, where it's too sharp and that can give you funky results with anything that has a pattern to it, like stripes or chains on a fence, and we call this moiré. So to negate this, and this is the first thing everybody should do, lower the sharpness two for the phantoms and raise it one if you have a Mavic. Even further, the D-Log color profile in Mavic Pro 1 and the Phantom 3 also give good results when you color grade them, but the D-Log in the Mavic Pro 2 and the Phantom 4 Pro, they're almost not even worth the trouble. I can't believe I'm saying that. These professional drones that come with supposedly superior color profiles, they actually have more difficult to use color profiles. And I remember that being such a surprise for me when I first used D-Log in the Phantom 4 Pro, no matter how much I played around with it, it only came out good, but it didn't come out miles better, which is what you typically get from shooting D-Log and then coloring manually. So with these, I shoot in decent alike or just normal and turn down the saturation and the contrast. The results are way better that way. But to get 10-bit color out of the Mavic 2 Pro, which is its biggest selling point, you have to shoot D-Log, and that means you have to shoot H.265, which is a new format, which is scary, and most editors can't handle it. So you have to have really current, really powerful software to deal with this, which is why I use Premiere Pro. But again, if you don't want to use the super advanced features, it's not the end of the world. You can still get great stuff out of these cameras, as long as you know what you're doing when you set up. Earlier, I promised I would go over five really easy and great cinematic shots to go for, but I've already made the chapter on this in my course, so what you're about to watch is a free preview. How fun is cinematography? <clears throat> cinematography, oh boy. You may have heard from a trusted friend that cinematography is difficult and you can't just do it yourself. Well, this person is an idiot. Block them on your phone, never speak to them again. Cinematography is fun and really, really satisfying. Not on the spot, but when you get home and you look at your stuff and you see how balanced and beautiful and even it is, you will be so happy with yourself. I have got just a fat, fat pile of shots that you can replicate yourself today and see how cool you become amongst your non-flying lowborn friends. Here we're going to show you a bunch of good but easy shots to get, and the first shot I've got the easiest, simplest, but also very much okay to use, low, fast, and over water. So get the drone like 10 feet over water, any less and the collision sensors might stop you mid-flight if it goes over a wave or something, but the point is to go straight ahead pretty fast and the water brushing beneath is really cool to look at, especially if there's waves beneath you because it gives it a lot of action. And that is also great for a sunset if you don't know how else to shoot it. Really good if you can manage to use this as an intro to reveal something else like a mountain, a resort, something in the background that you're filming. So if you were to fly over the water and lift up right before the golf course to show it below. Okay, shot number two, even easier, just straight down. Is this called kinda down? No, it's called straight down. Just aim the camera straight down, as far down as it can go, and fly straight at a constant speed. Let the patterns of houses or trees or rivers, whatever's beneath you, let it pass by, and that will be enough action for the shot. Something you may feel the urge to do is to change plans mid-shot and start aiming at the thing you just passed. Don't do this. A mature shot can start and finish with the cool stuff passing by, and not try to jerk and risk ruining the angle by twisting or raising the camera to keep aiming at whatever you're passing by. Just let it go. And when you see it in the editor, trust me, you will be happy with yourself. Shot number three, right down the line. How does this work? Step one, find a line. Step two, follow the line. Step three, that's it. That's all you have to do, you're done. Really, really simple. Again, find a line, let it split the frame perfectly and just follow it. Here I have a dirt road leading up to some beautiful mountains, but the intro to this still follows right over the dirt track. This one looks really pretty, but don't try it. It takes a master of flight and framing, like me. Just kidding, I screwed it up and I almost crashed because I hit a pole with a propeller. Thankfully, while I was trying to fly my limp drone back, I had Sombrero Guy walk up and say, yo, you're definitely gonna crash and start filming. So thanks a lot for that, Sombrero Guy. Here I've combined the last two shots we went over with a straight down and right along the line, split down the center frame for some cool symmetry. This is really easy gold to go for because people who live in this area will never have seen this perspective. Super, super high up, everyone's seen that from helicopter photos and plane photos, but barely anybody has seen 100 feet off the ground or lower. Shot three and a half. Remember when I said point straight down, not kinda down? Well, that was a joke. Kinda down is also a cool shot to consider, and it's great when you have rows and rows of similar items like houses or cars in a parking lot. Okay, but moving on to shot four, if you have a mountaintop, a pole top, a house and a hill, show off the height by circling that point. And this needs to be done with patience and steady fingers because you are now trying to rotate and move forward and over at the same time. So you're flying kind of at an angle position wise, but you are turning the drone to track that item. 
This usually takes a 10 second head start so you can kind of calibrate and figure out the rotation speed and the flight speed that works. But once you do, just keep it there and don't move a muscle and let the drone film. Because of that, these might take multiple tries because it's kind of a drift. I wouldn't trust the software in the drones like DJI's Orbit because it goofs on me really often. It's better done handheld with slow gimbal settings, but this is one of my favorites because you cover so much and it's always incredible to force perspective on the distance like that. This also works from far away with a slower turn when you have a much broader environment to show off, like a park. Shot five, fly just barely above anything busy happening beneath you. I'm talking about like 10 feet. If this was a river with tons of boats or a parade of people, anything, just fly straight overhead. Treat it like it's a landscape shot and you're trying to get the background. And as you pass by things below, it will show how fast the camera is moving and how much it's covering. If there is a lot happening, like huge waves crashing beneath, I would say go slow and let the action speak for itself. And that's if you have like a stampede of horses going by beneath or something. You can also tilt the camera a little bit to look at this directly if you think you're going to miss the action, but do it gently and this takes muscle memory because it's easy to mess things up that way. These shots are not hard to do. You don't have to worry about turning, rising, panning, and controlling the gimbal at the same time for any of these, so go out and give them a try because all they take is good taste. If you're interested in the rest of the course, I go over individual drones, optimal settings, what I have found from each of them. Yes, I've flown plenty. Their strengths and weaknesses in the same environment so you can see if it's worth the upgrade or not. And a heck of a lot more. These are all things I address in my great big brand new beautiful course called Aerial Video A to Z, which has basically A to Z everything you need to know about how to get good footage no matter what you're flying. 4K stock footage goes for about $100 per clip, but I hate when courses just tell you what to do. So I've included dozens of my own footage that I shot for you to use, which would normally rack up to thousands, just so you can get hands-on experience and apply what I'm showing you at the same time on the same footage that I'm working with and compare results. We go more in depth with cinematography flying, tips and tricks. I talk more about sales stuff, promotional ideas, how to get eyeballs on your work and get noticed from people who will pay you more, as well as some other settings to optimize your PC and software. This is in the best, easiest and fastest way I could think to teach this stuff. I make it very, very clear with GIFs, and text embedded in the direction so you can watch it visually while you're learning. I know that software looks scary. I know it's a big jump to get into this stuff, but I'm pretty sure I've made it as easy as possible and only shown you the important things to know to get great stuff, make it look even better in the editor, start to finish. And I talk about more sales stuff, promotional ideas, amateur red flags that would otherwise lose you work and how not to wind up with something boring or harsh and what steps to take to get something killer. You may notice that even new PCs struggle with 4K footage. I'm going to show you the tricks we use in Los Angeles to get this stuff working at warp speed even on an old computer. I am not kidding, this is going to save you days of editing. We'll go over a good and great PC setup and how much you can actually get away with if you're on a budget that will still be able to handle the insane resolution and power of 4K footage. As well as equipment, what you'll actually wind up using and what's just a toy you don't need to waste money on, like filters, polarizers, range extenders. We get super, super in-depth with cinematography, what I aim for when I'm framing up a shot, photography principles that apply directly to video, controller, gimbal, and drone settings that are the only reason I can get such dramatic, beautiful, clean, smooth shots and make a $300 toy fly like a several thousand dollar machine. And at the very end, I'll go out and do a shoot live from beginning to end so you can watch me film it, applying only the things I showed you in the course, see what I aim for on the spot, and then edit it from top to bottom so you can see how quick and easy it is to get cinematic footage if you know what to aim for. One more thing, we constantly update modules and info as the market changes. And if you get in now, you'll have access to the course for life. So if the price changes in the future when we add tons of stuff with new software and technology, you will still have access. I'm confident that this course has everything you need to drop JAWS. I've been working so hard on getting all this information together, nice and tidy. And if you hate it, you have 30 days to get all of your money back. But thanks for listening to me for three days straight. My name is Alex Harris, videography coach from Drone Launch Academy. Learn more from the course or just listen into our emails where we give out tons of tips, promos, discounts, and go get some awesome stuff for yourself.